Welcome back to the Meeple Marathon. Today we're going to be beginning our coverage of Merchant's Cove. This is a Euro uh, action selection game by Final Frontier Games. It has um, this merchant theme to it where every merchant is uh, very asymmetrical. Each merchant plays incredibly different than the next. And you are all trying to create goods, which are represented by these, you know, large and small good tokens on standees that you can see off to the side here. But you're attempting to produce them um, and kind of uh, gauge which customers are going to be coming into port. So you can see that these boats up here, which are pre-populated with people, we'll get to how we got to that point here in a second. Um, four of them each round are going to be coming into these various ports here. There's three, three docks. Um, and so you're trying to gauge which customers are coming in because, you know, green customers purchase green goods, blue customers purchase blue goods, gray customers just muck things up and, and take up space on the boats. Um, but anyways, the object of the game is to acquire gold from selling your wares to these customers and, you know, this snake-like, uh, dragon serpent tail thing that's going around the outside of the board is going to track your gold. Whoever has the most gold at the end of the game wins. Now, to c create a how to play video for Merchant's Cove would take forever if we discussed even just the four main merchants in the core box. So what I'm going to talk about today is how to set up the main board and the basics of gameplay that every merchant needs to know. Then I'm going to be producing a set of shorter videos where I cover each individual merchant in a separate shorter video. So that way, if you decide, ooh, I want to play as the blacksmith, then you can just watch the blacksmith video. Watch this video that covers the basics, and then you're set. You should understand how to play. So let's just go ahead and get started with setup here. First thing, just working top to bottom down the board here is you're going to want to set out the six standard boats. Now if you have the secret stash expansion you're going to have more than six but these are the six four seater boats. Technically you're going to put them out empty. I know that you see them filled up at the moment but just pretend they're empty at the moment. You're going to put out your uh, six boats, three on either side of this island in the middle. All right. Next then you're going to want to create your uh, worker deck our townsfolk deck. Now, they suggest that you create the deck, at least for your first couple games, using just two of the worker factions. So you can see that my particular deck here is nothing but the, the sword faction and this house symbol here. Um, I forget what the names of those are, but basically there's a little bit of synergy to the townsfolk, even though you don't need them to win the game. Um, I guess just adding more in of various factions increases the difficulty of the game. So they suggest you uh, sort out two factions for your first couple games, shuffle them up, deal out four right there. You're also going to give each of the guild halls one customer. So you can see these are the areas where customers who are not able to make it to the docks, they come here to hang out with their like-minded folk, drink a ale, and um, the collection of these characters here, or these customers here, are going to score you points throughout the game and at the end of the game. So keeping them here is important, but you always start the game with one at each location. There's also the rogues here, and this is the lair. Technically, it's not a guild hall or anything like that, but the amount of rogues, you can see there's actually two rogues here. The amount of rogues that you place in the lair is actually determined upon this rogue card here. So you can see this is what the back of the rogue card is, and there are several of the, you know, uh, numerous of these in the core box, and then the secret stash expansion adds even more. This happens to be the kind of introductory card, the very basic card. But you can see right here on the card that uh, two uh, rogues are going to go into um, the layer, and four then are going to go into the bag. So you're going to take all of, after you've pulled out the one of each color here, you're going to put all of the remaining red, green, blue, and yellow workers into this bag. Then you're going to take you know, according to this card, two rogues, put them in the lair. You're going to take four rogues, put them into the bag, and then all remaining rogues would go back in the box. So this uh, card 
these numbers up here vary. There's some symbols down here that vary. There's a symbol up here in the corner that varies. So choosing a different card adds a little bit of variety in the setup. Um, what this symbol up here in the corner means is that if I pull a rogue during the first arrival phase, um, it's going to go into the boat. If there was the bag picture there, any rogue that I pulled in the initial arrival phase would actually go back into the bag. But you can see I uh, actually have a couple already in the boats because technically I went so far as to begin the arrival phase of this setup. So, all right, moving down the board now, you are, depending on your player count, uh, looking at the clock now, you're going to want to place some of these uh, two tokens over top of some of these overlays. The instruction manual tells you which ones to cover up. This is set up for a two-player game. So in a two-player game, the 930 and the 1130 uh, slots get covered up with a two. Um, and that varies determining on player count. You're always going to take the little market token, put it on the 12th. And you're always going to take the two mice and place them over these two corruption tokens. That means that in the first round of the game, we can only travel around the main numbers on the clock. But after the first round, this mouse is going to come off here. So we're actually going to start further along the clock. But we're going to have the ability to choose to go up there if we want and come back down. That Two things happen when we do that. Actually, three things. One is you take a corruption card if you take that path. Two is you gain an extra hour because instead of going directly from five to six, you go to 5.30, then to six. And hours is, you know, how you, the, the currency you have to spend to complete actions in this game. And the rounds are very tight. The amount of actions you get to complete in a game are not numerous. So gaining an extra hour can mean the difference between getting everything you want done in a round and not. Um, and the last thing you're going to do is you've actually skipped over, you've bypassed the ability to place a customer in a boat. So again, it slows the whole round down because as soon as four total boats get filled up and come into a dock, then the round is over. So, um, so you're always going to put the market dial here. You're always going to put the two mice ones here. Depending on your player count, you're going to put these two out somewhere or possibly not at all. And then based on the uh, faction banner that your side has chosen, you can see here that I chose purple and the AI I gave blue. It doesn't matter your color because the factions are so asynchronous. Um, you know, they just created four banners to match the four uh, tokens here. And you basically just pick one and give that to your, your merchant. So. You give everybody a dial here, a cog, I guess you could say, and put them on the one. Uh, and you give everybody a coin purse here and put it on the kind of start space here. This is going to track your gold throughout the game. As you pass around here, if you pass 100, you're going to get a red gem to signify that you have 100 gold. And then you're just going to keep going around the track and around the track and around the track. Last but not least, you're going to take your corruption cards. You can see here that this is a pretty big stack because this includes, again, secret stash components. Um, but you're basically going to shuffle those up and place them in a stack right here. That is uh, basically it. Setup is not too convoluted. It's pretty straightforward. Um, really, the only um, thing that was a little annoying was separating out the townsfolk and then picking two and then shuffling them together and things like that. But other than that, everything was um, you know, very straightforward and set up. So let's talk about um, the phases of the game and then how you play. So the first phase of the game is the arrival phase. And that's where you actually initially seed the customers in the boats. Um, you're going to randomly from I do left to right. Technically, it doesn't say you have to go left to right. You can go right to left or center out, it doesn't matter. But you're going to randomly draw customers out of the bag and place them two into each boat. And that's it. Now, there are uh, certain merchants like the peddler who do some additional things during the arrival phase. But other than that, you're mostly just uh, seeding those boats with initial customers and again whether or not you put rogues into the boats depends on this symbol on this road card here all right after we have um, 
moved on from the arrival phase, we're gonna go to the production phase. And this is the main phase of the game. This is where we are moving our uh, character here. Each merchant comes with a little miniature and you're gonna be moving them around your board, selecting your actions that are going to hopefully help you produce goods that you're gonna then put on your little shelf here for sale. And then once the production phase is over, you're gonna sell those goods, hopefully to lots of waiting customers get lots of money, track the money, move on to the next round. So how do we go about doing that? Well, I'm gonna bring out the blacksmith board just as an example. You always are gonna start here on this uh, activate your townsfolk space because when it's your turn, you have to move your little miniature. You cannot keep them in the same spot. They have to be moved to another location on your player board and take that action. You don't start the game with Townsfolk, so you wouldn't ever need to activate Townsfolk as your first action. So that's where you start and you have to move off from there. Every merchant board has the activate Townsfolk action and gain Townsfolk action. Other than that, everybody's board is completely different. Um, the actions that you take and how you go about producing those goods are very different than every other merchant. For example, the blacksmith here takes dice of the various colors and also the coal dice. And you're trying to basically uh, stack dice in each furnace that's gonna hit a specific number based on the pip count on the dice. Um, and you start the game with four dice here in reserve and you can give up dice to gain those dice out and things like that. But um, again, I'm gonna cover each individual merchant in a separate video. But basically, I just need you to understand that during the production phase is when you are moving around your board. And the other thing that needs you need to understand now is that each action has a cost in hourglasses. Remember, your currency for completing actions is not money, uh, but it's time. So we're dealing in time here. And so every action that you take has an amount of time and that's when you come back to your clock here with your cog. Now technically if I'm going first and I'm the purple player I should be on top and if I take an action that takes one time I move my marker there if I take an action that takes two time I would move it there and basically we're just working our way around the board until either we put enough worker customers into the boat that four boats come to port or we hit this market phase token here. Um, now, what's important to note about the clock is that whoever is behind, whoever is last, gets to go. It's their turn. So if I were to start here like this and take an action that goes one, two, and push this far ahead of the other player, the other player could take a single action, single hourglass action, and they're still behind, so they would get to go again. They could even then take another single hourglass action and pop up on top of me. If you have a tie, if people are stacked like this um, on a, and they're in, in the back, and this comes into play a lot in a two player game, whoever is on top, it's their turn. So again, this person, maybe they take a two hour glass action that time, actually got to take three turns after I took my initial turn before I get to go again. So understanding that whoever's in the back, it's their turn, and so they could go multiple times in a row, and if it's a tie, whoever's stacked on top gets to take the turn. So until blue leapfrogs ahead of purple, purple just sits and has to watch blue continue to take turns. Now, and again, all of that is based on how many hour glasses your action costs is how many spots around the clock you would move here. All right, <clears throat> so as we move around the clock, you can see we will pass certain markers here where we will get to add customers to the boat. So say I get here and come here and then I take that action and I move there. First of all, I need to complete whatever action I have done on my board. Again, that is specific to the merchant. We're not gonna talk about that. But after I've completed my action, I need to come back here and say, ooh, I need to add a customer. It's pretty straightforward. You bring out the bag. You reach in, you randomly pull out a customer, and then you get to choose where this customer goes. 
on the boat. You load the boat, but you get to choose. So let's come back up here and look at the docks because where you want that customer to end up um, is critical to the game. So there's three docks here and you can see that this central dock is actually going to get two boats coming to it every round. But each dock you can only sell certain things at. So this dock on the left you can only sell your large goods. So that's these taller ones they're obviously larger than the other ones and you can only sell goods that match in color to the customers but say I take this meeple here and I just happen to randomly draw green and I put that one there and then I'm just gonna steal this from this guy here and I put this one here all right then this boat I decide needs to end up at this dock these people all unload here ideally I would want to have a green large good to sell here because for my one uh, six green good, I take the six and I multiply it by how many green customers there are. Think of this as competition. They drive up the price on each other. The green customers all want that green large sword of my blacksmith. And so they are each going to outbid the other, driving up the price three times as high as if it was just a single guy. And he said, yep, I will take it at market value. I will pay you six for it. But when there's three here, they each say, I'll pay you six, no, I'll pay you 12, no, I'll pay you 18. And you sell it for 18. So again, kind of gauging which customers are gonna come into which docks is important for which goods you decide to create. All right, so let's come back to our boats here, our boat scenario. All right, so that's the left dock. The middle dock only sells small goods. So that's these small ones here like this, obviously smaller. Uh, again, matching the customers. So you can only sell a yellow small good to a yellow customer here at this dock. Over here is the black market. You can actually sell both large goods and small goods at the black market. You still need to match the customer color, but if you do so, you gain a corruption card. Now corruption cards are bad. This is an exceptionally bad one that I just happened to draw off the top. For each corruption symbol that you have on any cards or any townsfolk cards, like here at the end of the game, gets added up and that is multiplied by the number of rogues in the layer for negative points in final scoring. So if you go to the black market, you could technically pawn off something that you weren't able to sell at these first two, but you're going to uh, suffer a little bit for it. Now there are ways to get rid of your corruption cards throughout the game. For example, hiring this townsfolk here would allow you to discard any one corruption card. but. Just know that whichever customers come at this stock only buy large goods, the customers that come to this stock only buy small goods, and these are the uh, shady customers who will buy any good but at the cost of one corruption. So what happens when you fill up a boat? So let's just say for example, let's come back here and I have now taken this action, probably would be further along in the game at this point and I draw another green meeple and say I've been producing large green goods out the wazoo. I've got two sitting on my shelf. I could put them anywhere, remember? I could choose which boat, but anytime you fill up a boat, you decide which dock in front of you, the boat you want to dock it in. So these three boats, one, two, three, can only go to these two spots. And these three boats, one, two, three, can only go to these two spots. So this boat, could never come over here, vice versa. And once, say, this spot is filled and this spot is filled, these people jump ship and come to their guild halls. That boat is emptied, you place them in the guild halls, and these are the only people you're selling to. So, back to the clock. Anytime you pass by one of these symbols, you get to randomly draw a worker meeple out of the bag, you place them in any boat that you choose, and then if you fill up a boat, placing the fourth worker meeple in the boat, you get to choose which dock it comes down to. Uh, so again, I could have chosen 
this one to come over here. I could choose this one to come here, but I could not put it over there. All right. So um, that is the load the boat phase. Uh, and again, these multipliers were added based on the player count. So say later on in the round, I come up here and I pass this token, I actually get to draw two worker meeples out of the bag. Um, but if at any point you place a customer into a boat and you pull it in and the fourth boat comes in, even if you have more meeples left to draw or add, the adding of customers is done. So you can ignore these symbols if you happen to continue passing them. All right, but that's the production phase. Um, or that's the main crux of the production phase is taking your actions, moving around the clock, and filling up the boats. And understanding that where you put those meeples in the boats and which dock they come down to uh, does make a huge amount of difference in the game. Now, I want to briefly talk about the two actions that are on every merchant's board, and that is the Activate Townsfolk and the Gain Townsfolk. This one's very straightforward. Gain Townsfolk, you're going to come up here to the center and you're going to choose which one of these guys do I want. I can pick any one, but they come at a cost. These two in the middle each cost two time to convince to come work for them. This person, this first person here is going to cost two time plus a corruption card. This one costs a time and a corruption card. Now, once you decide on who you're going to hire, you're instantly going to gain the uh, what's underneath. So these guys didn't line up very well. Let's see who else. All right, that's not that great of an example. I'm looking for... Uh, nope, nope, nope. Man, where's all my large goods people? They are not... There's one, okay. All right, so we got a pretty good spread now. Um, so if I were to hire one of these townsfolk, I instantly can discard a corruption card from my hand. If I hire this guy, he instantly gives me a small blue good. However, if I hire this guy, he instantly gives me a large red good. And if I hire this creepy looking barber, I can instantly discard three corruption cards. Now, what's... Um, what you need to understand is say for example this guy is over here I choose to hire this guy I cannot use his symbol to cancel out the corruption card I gain from hiring him this needs to happen instantly and then I resolve the time cost of my action which includes bringing in the corruption card so if I pick this guy up hopefully I already have a corruption card that I can get rid of but then I'm instantly gonna gain another one back but that is the hire the townsfolk action card. Now, when you hire a townsfolk, it is going to be slotted into your townsfolk board here. And these boards are unique to each of the merchants. So this one is the blacksmiths. And just as an example here, this one allows me to increase or decrease the pips on my coal die here, which are always in my furnace. This one allows me to load a furnace for free. This one allows me to go ahead and forage from two furnaces. And this one allows me to uh, remove a corruption from my hand. So when I hire a worker, I need to choose. I go ahead and I take my instant gift, and then I need to choose which job do I want him to do? Well, let's say I want to be able to mess with my pips. All right, and then let's say later on in the round, I select her and I have a slot her right there. Now, this is my uh, merchant's unique townsfolk board. And then at some point I can take the activate the townsfolk action, which means I come to my board here and any slot that has a townsfolk in it, I get to activate. I get to do that action for free. It's not free, I'm paying two time to do it. But, so if I have all four of these with a townsfolk in them, I get to do all four, and I can do them in any order. But this, for example, I can mitigate my cold dice up or down, which could lead to not gaining corruption. And then I could turn around and I could forge in two different furnaces. Just as an FYI, when you normally forge with the blacksmith, you get to do all of them. But if you come over here and get to do all this other stuff, you only get to pick two. But 
this is a strategy for building your engine um, you know is adding these townsfolk to your individual townsfolk board and then activating the board so every merchant has the gain townsfolk action and the activate townsfolk action all right so <clears throat> that is everything that there is to do in the production phase again your goal is to be producing goods onto your shelf getting the right customers to port um, and then ending the round hopefully in a position where you can sell all your goods at the best multiplier um, <clears throat> so that's pretty much it there's um, some specifics for how the round ends and I apologize I skipped over this but any time that the fourth boat makes it into dock you're going to take this market token and you're going to move it and place it in front of the most furthest ahead player in the clock so even if this guy's way back here you're going to move it from the 12 and put it in this example on the 10 or if for some reason we were way back here i don't know how that would work you would move it to here all right once that has happened once the market token has been moved everybody gets at least one more turn but as soon as you have either basically stacked onto the market token if you would advance it go ahead and stop there you're done you no longer take any actions the technically the person in the back is going to be taking their actions first but as everybody gets to continue taking actions until they are stacked on top of the merchant board again keep track of the stack the order of the stack because that's going to determine the player order at the beginning of the next round once you reset this but basically that's all you need to know this just market symbol says hey when's the market phase going to happen and whenever the boats the fourth boat comes in it shuts down that way you don't get additional time to be you know cheating knowing exactly who's coming to market um, that and that's why this token is a token and not built down to the board after the production phase is the market phase so I briefly covered this now um, I'm gonna put these guys back here let's just say these guys come down here and we're gonna put we're just gonna pretend that this boat had all of these people in it and normally you would have filled in here as well and let's just pretend there's people over there all right okay so this is somewhat what the board would look like during your production phase now as a merchant you get to choose whether you want to sell your goods or not let's just say for example that this is what the large goods looked like and these are the two goods I had for sale on my shelf I would probably definitely want to sell this one as I mentioned before you're going to take this the amount the good is worth and you're going to multiply it by the amount of customers in that matching color and that's going to be the gold you earn so in this case I would earn 18 gold for selling this one good to the green customers now I could sell this good for a multiplier of one for just eight or maybe I'm thinking mm, I'm gonna hold on to this maybe and try and get multiple blues into that port on the next round or there could be several blues at the black market and the black market could look like this and you could say mm, I'm gonna hold on to this wait till I get to the black market and then I'm gonna sell it for 24 but take a corruption card any so normally while you're playing your game every merchant has a unique little sales shelf this just happens to be the blacksmiths as you sell your goods again you can choose not to sell them and leave them on your shelf for the next round but as you sell them they just are returned to your general supply and every merchant has their own unique goods you can see this is the blacksmith's large red and this is the alchemist's large red so very different and unique from the next so keep your goods together um, separate from everyone else's but as you sell to someone, you put the goods back and you move your tracker along the serpent's tail here, keeping track of your gold. Each player gets to do that. This, um, this round can be done simultaneously with other players, 
but technically if you are really wanting to know whether someone who is higher in player order than you is going to sell their goods before you sell yours you can technically go in player order based on where the cogs are so keep that in mind but usually it works better that everybody just goes ahead and knocks it out at the same time once you have sold your goods you come down here to your sponsorship phase and this is where you are going to count up the amount of um, workers in each guild hall now remember any workers that are left behind in a boat for example these two guys away up here that's these are the ones that come down to the guild hall these guys at the docks they're going to get returned back to the bag but the ones that were left in the boats these are them now coming back to the merchant board here every merchant has these two actions they also have an area where they have um, four matching sponsorship icons on every merchant board these are going to start the game covered up so in a on the blacksmith's board they're covered up with dice of the same color and it looks like this now as the game progresses hopefully i can remove some of these exposing the sponsorship icon because at the end of every market phase, for every sponsorship icon that I have revealed, I get to gain a coin for each customer in that guild. So if I, I need to put these back in the right spot, if this is what my board looked like after the first round and a ton of green guys have been dumped in here, I would actually get five additional gold for having a green guild sponsorship hopefully these guys are the bards so a bard sponsorship if this is what my board looked like at the end of the first round i would get five for green and one for red i would get nothing for blue and i would get nothing for yellow because i still have them covered up what you don't need to pay attention to yet are any uh, guild symbols on your townsfolk cards or your corruption cards which you can see some of them here for example the mage the blue mage uh, guild here on that if you ended up with that corruption card saved at the end of the game you could count that so these are counted at the end of the game the ones on your player board are counted at the end of the market phase all right but after we have completed the market phase we are going to do the cleanup phase, which means you're going to take all of the worker meeples who are on the docks, all the customer meeples, you're going to return them back to the bag. You're going to take the rightmost townsfolk, put him on the bottom, shift everybody over, draw a new one. All right. And you're also going to take your clock here you're going to return this to the 12 in case it got moved based on the rules of how you end the round and um, then you're after the first round you're going to take this first mouse and you move him and cover up the one you're going to place your guys your tokens exactly how they were stacked at the end of the round and start them on two at the end of the second round it would look like this all right so that's the cleanup phase, pretty straightforward. Um, there might be some additional actions you need to take on your specific merchant board, but again, um, really just resetting the boats, ready for arrival phase, um, and shuffling up some of the merchants and setting up the clock how it needs to be is all you need to do for the cleanup phase. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that covers the basics of how to play Merchant's Cove. Uh, again, most of the scoring is done during each of the market phases. You're tracking your gold throughout. There is some end game scoring that deals with the guild halls and your sponsorships and all that stuff. Um, but we, it's pretty straightforward. It's in the rule book. Um, like I said, you're basically counting up matching icons on your townsfolk cards along with your corruption cards. And you're also counting up corruption icons and multiplying them by rogues in the layer and taking negative points. And that's it. So that is the basics of how to play Merchant's Cove. In our next video, we'll talk about how to play the blacksmith. 
and then we will work our way through the remaining core box merchants so the alchemist the captain and then um, chronomancer and we'll also discuss the peddler which is technically the solo ai merchant is the peddler so we're going to talk about how to play the game solo which means you need to know how to manage the solo ai which is the peddler again all of those are going to come in their own separate shorter videos so if you're not interested in watching uh, one particular merchant you are not forced to so if you've enjoyed this video please consider giving a thumbs up and if you'd like to see more content including the remaining merchant how to play videos please consider subscribing to the channel once again thanks for watching have a great day